When it comes to pursuing your health and fitness goals, whether it be fat loss or muscle gain or improved strength or athletic performance, your choices are not do it the right way and the slow way or do it the wrong way and do it fast. Those are not the two choices. It's a myth. It's not fast or slow. It's yes or no. In other words, the right way is the only way to get where you want to go. The wrong way doesn't get you there faster. It doesn't get you there at all. So get that through your head, everybody. There's right and wrong. There's yes and no, not fast and slow. Oh, you're gonna have to, they're going to have to chew on that for a minute. Yeah. Because it's not fast and slow, it's yes you, and no. Well, you, there there is a temporary yes sometimes that I that's think, a no still right? yeah you're right that's yeah. what you know so i think that's where you got to chew on that a minute because you think like oh well i did it yeah, but i lost 20 pounds yeah before. i lost 20 pounds yeah the question is did you keep it off yeah, you gained it back mm, though didn't you that's mm. right if you gain it back then what's the point of all that if you just got a temper and by the way every time you do that it's that much harder the next time that you try and lose it so doing it the right way is the only way because you're going to eventually put it back on and every time you eventually put it back on it's that much harder. To I, I want to communicate this because yeah. that's the thought that people have in their head. Like, oh, I, yeah, I could do it the right way, but once it's going to take get longer. There, I'll do it the right way. Yeah, and it's going to take longer. And, you know, I want to just get there. I want to get there fast. And like what you said, Justin, I used to get this all the time where someone would say, well, fine, but let me just get there the fast way. And then we'll figure it out how to keep it off when we get there. It's like trying to build a house. Mm -hmm. quickly without a foundation and then <laughs> yeah. once you built the house you're like okay now let's figure out how to keep this thing from falling apart have you, you ever done that okay so one time i had no, I've never guy... built a house <laughs> <laughs> oh, no foundation yeah, no, yeah. <laughs> no crickets no it was just for like a, a shed like outside and i remember um the foundation itself you couldn't even tell well, just by sight right <laughs> it it was sloped just just ever so slightly but as we go to to actually frame it and put uh all the boards up and everything else like just that little bit of like a half an inch difference, like turned into an inch, turned into two inches. Like the further out we went, like it got exponentially uh, greater the the gap and the oh, distance. Yeah. With you, it. And so it was so obnoxious. Do you remember when uh, my stepdad explained that when he built the studio in Truckee? Mm -hmm. I thought that was so interesting when he showed me like like how like how difficult such a simple build like that was because it was in our garage and garages are all designed to have a very slight, slight slope, slope. Yeah. so they like they drain out or whatever and the studio is yeah, only i don't everything know square 10 or 12 feet long and so at the other end it was like a, a millimeter off from the other side or something mm -hmm. so and i'm like who cares dad is this yeah. be, i'm like this one's not on video we're not using on time it doesn't matter if it's on. he's like oh yes it does yeah you yeah. know he's like because for every millimeter it's off here everything else that we're gonna do it just compounds and then the whole thing will be crooked and it's like yeah, yeah. so i've ne i've never built anything so here's my analogy <laughs> <laughs> i've definitely put together things from ikea or toys for my kids oh lord and you ever miss a piece early on in the build yeah. And then you go through still in the bag. You're like, wait a minute, where is this? Guy? Yeah. And then you go through and you end up forcing stuff, you know, and then you start to force think, things and force this things. This. And then you're like, you can't force another piece. And then you have to go all it's like you can't fix the mistake. Just fix it. You have to go all the way back. Disassemble it and start over. Yes. That's, that's that's what you're dealing with when you do it the wrong way. That's right. So it's not, it's there's a total Myth out there that the fast, the wrong way is the fast way. The wrong way is the wrong way. Period. End of story. Well, and I've said before too on here that it's actually really ironic because when you do it the right way, you actually the body composition change is actually faster. Yeah, yep. like that's what. Let's so like when you think okay, someone who wants to lose like twenty pounds of fat, right? I want to lose twenty pounds of fat. Yeah, it's a body not just twenty pounds, right? Not just twenty pounds. I want to lose twenty pounds of fat. Yes, the fastest way may look like the scale, like not moving at all. Because they have this beautiful exchange of every time they lose a pound of fat or so, they also built a muscle, built muscle. And that will create a different body composition change faster than That's just right. dropping 20 pounds. But because the scale is moving like ridiculously slow, they think that their progress is moving super slow and then they make overcorrections. Oh no, I got to ramp up the calorie burn or oh, I got to cut more calories. But in reality, and which is so hard to communicate to somebody who is just starting their fitness journey and wants to lose 30, 40, 50 pounds that you're like, well, technically the best way we could do this is actually not to see much movement on the scale at all. Is it, cause especially if I got you weight training, we're hitting our protein intake, we should see a very nice exchange. I'm going to add to that. When you do it the right way, it actually 
feel well it is a lot easier it is you're working with your body and this is this is where people sometimes also get messed up mm -hmm. is they're doing things the right way their body is changing everything's working well and then they think well i'm not working hard enough because this isn't hard enough yeah. so i can get there faster if i beat myself up more and people really screw things up when they do this it's like wow i'm burning well, a half a percent or a per percent of body fat a week i'm getting stronger let me do a yeah. bunch more stuff to make it happen faster. And what ends up happening is they plateau or go backwards. Usually they're getting stronger and they're doing everything correctly, but yeah. the, the the scale itself isn't changing or yeah. it's like increasing by like one pound. And it's like, ah, it's this, this like hysteria over that fact. And so we got to abruptly change like the entire plan, which then leads them down this path of speed. Physiologically, it is, is way easier to do it the right way, but psychologically it's a lot harder. That's right. That's the part we get in our own way because we think we want to see this number of scale. And because we're so fixated on that, we get it. That's the difficult. That's the, the thing you're wrestling with every single day or the reflection in the mirror, because that can be very deceiving. Also, you're looking at yourself in the mirror. You had you know, extra water or sodium that day, or maybe you had a food that your body reacted to a little bit. So there's a little bit of bloat and you interpret that reflection as, oh my God, I got fat. Yeah. Mm -hmm. you know overcorrect. Yeah. Or, oh my God, I, I'm not cutting. I'm, I'm putting on weight. It looks terrible. You know, and then you overcorrect. And it's like, man, if you just. I'll, here's some of the, I'll, I'll, I'll say right now, the best phrase or word you'll ever hear out of your clients. And for trainers and coaches who've been doing this for a while, you've heard this before, you know exactly what I'm talking about. When you hear this, it's literally angel singing. And this is what, this is what you'll hear. This is when you do a good job and you're really crushing and your, your client is on the right path. This is what you'll hear, man, this is really weird. Uh, I'm getting leaner. I feel like I'm eating a lot of food and I don't feel like I'm working out that much. Like what's going on? Like, oh, this is weird. When Seems I would hear that, from, yeah, when I, yes, when you guys would hear that from a client, we're just like, oh, you just feel this wonderful, yeah. warm feeling. And then I tell them like, that's how it's supposed to be. Yeah. It's not supposed to feel like you're clawing at every single incremental change and that you're just redlining the whole time. Working with your body feels good. It doesn't feel bad. Now the struggle is in the consistency. The struggle is in changing your behaviors. But it shouldn't feel like you're literally spinning your tires in the dirt. Mm -hmm. You're redlining. You're you're scraping for everything that you. That's not that. That means you're you're. There's a lot of inefficiencies. That means you're fighting against your body. Which, by the way, I'm gonna tell you something right now. The body is undefeated. Your body will never lose the battle. If you yeah. fight against your body, your body will ramp up until you lose, and and that can look really really bad. Well, I know it's, we're kind of alluding to like fat loss and and nutrition and all that but like with your workouts the same thing we get yeah. this all the time where it's it's like well i feel like i could have done a lot more and and that, that workout was actually kind of i hate to say it like it was kind of easy although i am lifting more weights than i was before yeah. <laughs> maybe i should crush myself a little harder you know and it's like and then they crush themselves a little harder and then they get sore and it's like this you know stall and they hit this plateau and it's like you are on the right path like keep going like to the point where you know you want it to energize you you want to have like those strength gains but it you know it's okay if it like feels like well i probably had a little more in the tank that's just fine. Well, yeah. yeah, that's part of the overcorrection, right? Rarely ever do I see somebody uh, see the reflection, see the scale and go, oh, I'm going to make a minor adjustment and just cut a little bit. Or I'm going to like maybe yeah. walk an extra thousand steps or something like that. That's not, they overcorrect it by going, oh my God, I need to restrict calories and I need to ramp up intensity. It's like the worst thing they could possibly do is like the simultaneously do that to themselves. And that's what really causes the overcorrection. They probably would have been okay with adding one more set in their workout or deciding they're going to go for a walk for a half hour additional to their activity for that day. Like that would be a nice minor adjustment to see, Oh, maybe it's minor. I mean, yeah. yeah. But it never is that. It's no, always it's the always extreme a, other it's, direction. It's, it's Make like myself puke. Now. It, it's like, what do you learn when you're, when you're driving and you, you, you if, if you start to hydroplane a little bit or you have to steer in one direction a little bit, they tell you don't overcorrect. Yeah. Cause what happens? Like, Oh no, Overcorrect. Now I'm screwed. My car's yeah. gonna flip, or yeah, I'm gonna yeah, spin yeah, around on the highway. Spin. That's exactly what happens. And so it should feel. This is what it should feel like if you're doing it the right way. The challenge should feel. Uh, you should feel the challenge with the consistency. You should feel the challenge with the behavior changes. There's there, that's that's true. But in terms of your body, you should feel better. 
You should feel more energized. You should feel like you're working together, like you and your body are partners in this and things are happening and you just, man, I feel phenomenal. I have more energy to do things, not I'm using up every bit of energy just to do these workouts to try and lose this last five pounds. That's the wrong feeling when you're doing that kind of stuff. Today's giveaway is the super bundle. That's a lot of programs you can win for free. Here's how you can win. Leave a comment below this video in the first 24 hours that we drop it. Subscribe to this channel and turn on notifications. If you win, we'll let you know in the comments section. Also, only 48 hours left for our September program sale. Map Symmetry, half off, and the RGB bundle, half off. If you're interested in either one, act now, because again, it ends in two days. Click on the link at the top of the description below. All right, back to the show. Speaking of fitness and muscle and all that stuff, uh, I have a, a study on muscle and longevity, which is kind of good or kind of interesting. So check this out, right? This, is a, this was a big study uh, where they were looking for associations of muscle mass and strength with all-cause mortality among older adults. And the conclusion in this was that low muscle strength was independently associated so by itself, okay, it controlled all factors that we know of that contribute to mortality. Low muscle strength on its own was associated with elevated risk of all-cause mortality, regardless of muscle mass, metabolic syndrome, sedentary time um, among U.S. older adults. So in other words, muscle itself is extremely protective and contributes to longevity. In fact, low muscle strength, Okay, people who rank low in their their category or the chart, which I know you're going to ask me what the, what that is. I'm not quite sure what the metric was, so I'm sure they used a, a an average among people and the people that were in the lower end. Low muscle strength, ready for this? Fifty percent increase across the board. Wow! In all cause mortality wow. across the board. Wow! All things being equal, it's wow. really it's really insane. That's yeah. a, that's a big number. Muscle is is a protective organ. Period. End of story. It's actually. One of the most anti-cancer things you could do is build muscle. And it's also the most effective thing you could do to improve insulin sensitivity, mm -hmm. both of which are major um, contributors to contributors to all-cause mortality in modern societies. You know, not that I'm in a hurry for us to get old, but there is a part of me that is very curious that our or when our generation gets into the, mm. you know, 70, 80s, like yeah, are how we, many of us stay muscular? Yeah, like and like, are we gonna see like yeah. when you when you I'll walk in a gym right day. now and like a, a a big box like you know commercial gym? Uh, what would you say? There's a handful of seniors in there working out at best. Um, depends on the time, but yeah, 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 right. Like a handful early morning, usually, yeah, but you're and right, even yeah. then, like a handful or so, you don't yeah. see twenty, thirty, or half no, the gym. A lot of them are doing cardio more than like yeah, lifting weights. Yeah, yeah. very rarely. Like yeah. so, but, but as we get older, I think more people. Will well, that's what I'm wondering. Like, is are, is it going to like completely even change like what? Like and maybe even that That'd be cool. And we'll know, the way we'll know is how the market responds by if g gyms start to yeah, you know design and shape them to cater to seniors because they're more and more of them are lifting weights into advanced age. So it'd be interesting to see because we it's really I feel like our generation that has start to make it really popular to where like more and more people I hope weights. it becomes a part of the culture because there are cultures that are out there where it's a part of the culture for when you're older you do these disciplined exercise routines like China and Japan. I know in Japan for example you know, I know, Doug, you're very familiar with Japanese culture. Older populations, it is part of the culture for them to do exercises in a morning routine. You no, know, mm -hmm. isn't that? I thought that was, you say China or Japan? Japan. Like, I thought China does. I thought China does, does that yeah, as well. China tai does chi. the Tai Chi. Yes. Uh, Japan, I think, I think there's a real culture around calisthenics. That's it. Yeah. For example, like uh, companies, I don't know if yeah. they do that so much anymore as they used to, but they used to, before anybody started work in the yeah. morning, they'd have everybody out and yep. they'd be doing their calisthenics. Yeah. Yep. And, and if you look at a traditional, so I saw this on that, what was that series, Adam, that you recommended? Oh, the hundred, live to a hundred. Is that one? what it was? Yeah, well, yeah, it's, I forget what's Anyway, called. they showed Okinawa, right? And, yeah. and they were showing that they, a lot of them were living in traditional ways, right? Yeah. So like traditional How about Japanese like the, the 90 year old lady who's like no chairs or anything like that? Well, that's a traditional Japanese home. Yeah. Is yeah. you sit on the that's floor. so rad. So you're constantly getting up and sitting down several times a day as part of your, it's a part of your culture. So their mobility and their strength uh, is significantly better 
then, you know, what do we do here, right? What do we do here? Oh, you know, you, you're, you're, it's hard for you to sit down now. We're going to get you this chair mm -hmm. that lifts you up and helps you get out. Yeah. And at first it helps, but then your body adapts to it, actually gets worse. When I worked, so I used to have this incredible physical therapist in my wellness studio. She was phenomenal at what she did, one of the best. And, and I took for granted how good she was because looking back, it was like, I learned so much from her. She would work with older people who would hire her because of her background. She would do everything she could to prevent them from using a walker or a cane. So they'd say, oh, my doctor keeps telling me to use a cane or a walker. And she'd say, we're going to do everything we can. Because I know the second you start using that on a daily basis, yep. you're going to lose some function. Because you're going to start to morph into yeah. adapting to be able to use this Crutchy. walker. Yeah. And you're going to see your health decline. And I remember having these tough conversations with clients and the client's children because their children would bring them in. Yeah. And the kids are like, but grandma fell already. We got to give her a walker. And she's like, no, I understand. We don't want her to fall, but I want her to use this as minimally as possible or not at all because the second she starts using it on a daily basis, things start to decline even faster. You, you know, what's funny is when I went on that kick, you know, a couple of years ago, it's been a while now, uh, on like my mobility, my ankle mobility, my hips to get down. Uh, there was a period of time there afterwards where people were kind of razzing me afterwards. Just, oh, Adam's always flexing his mobility, his newfound mobility and stuff. It's like, that wasn't the case at all. What, what I've done now and I've continued this is like, I make that part of my routine. If I'm building Legos with my son and I have an opportunity to lay on the floor and do it, which seems like the lazy, more comfortable thing to do, I'll choose to sit in a squat just mm -hmm. to just train myself to have yeah. that. And yeah. what's great is that it's only taken, I don't know how many years in my life now of making that like a habit. It's just now it's natural. It's second nature for me to anytime I get down, I just get down. That, and, it, and now it's comfortable. Yeah. I've actually can be in a position that I just remember not that long ago, burning my shins and hips on fire and so uncomfortable to be in that position. I can now rest in that position. And it's like, man, how many of us lose that as we start to get to 20, 30 years old and then you just, you think the work to get back there is so daunting. So you just discount it or you do the bare minimum to get in and get your workout done. And then you just write it off versus just trying to implement it into your lifestyle. And then before long, you'll see that, you know, they do study when they do studies on uh, modern hunter gatherers, they are more active than the average, obviously Westerner, but they also take a lot. So a lot of people thought that assume that hunter gatherers is constantly moving. But that's not true. They actually take lots of rest breaks and lots of break, lots of breaks where they're where they're hanging out with family and each other type of deal. But their their resting positions are very different. They rest in active positions. They sit in a squat. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They sit. They don't sit on the floor or in a chair or on a tree. They're sitting in a semi-active position. Unlike like I could literally fall asleep. Yeah. And I would still say seated. You know, if you sit in a squat, if you fall asleep, you fall over. So you have to. There's some level of activity that's required in order to do well that. not only that but i think people forget too like there's more to like okay sure that's good for my ankles and my hips like that's obvious right to get down that but there's like core posture shoulder like when you're in that pelvic floor yeah, yeah like that's all being activated i mean i sit in this chair and i could core is not activated Nothing. i mean it, and that's it's if it's not being worked it's not being activated it atrophies mm -hmm. what the, the most important muscle in your body besides your heart is your core muscle that supports your entire spine so the fact that we do all these things to crutch that it's going to atrophy and you think because you train three to five days a week and you do some, you know, you do some planks every <laughs> once in a while that you, you, you're going to have it. like, no, you would way rather have a core that's used to being in a rested position. It's still activated and working. Like that's going to you support know, longevity. Lumbo pelvic hip complex that like it, it, in terms of like breaking your hip and then not having the ability uh, to get up and down for a while is like a big determiner of how rapidly people's health. Oh my God. Decreases and like leads to death. And that's like with, with the elder Population. You know what's interesting. In, you know what's interesting about this is that we often talk about the the incredibly transformative benefits of proper exercise across the board, right? It's like, I mean, I just looked at another study now where they're looking at depression, and they're like, this is one of the most significant things you do to alleviate depression is get better sleep, eat a healthy diet, and exercise. Exercise being near the top, right? Anti cancer, anti heart disease like pro mental health, like just across the board. But what's interesting is I think it has less to do with the 
miraculous benefits of those things and more to do with the fact that regular modern life moves us away from what we're supposed to do so much that really what we're doing is we're going back to where we're supposed to be. No different than if you have a vitamin D deficiency and you take vitamin D, it's miraculous. And it's not because vitamin D is miraculous. It's because you were at a deficiency. Yeah. You're not in the sun. You're not outside. You're, you're in a totally different environment. Right. So the average person gets all these incredible benefits from exercise because they're sick. Yeah. Because we're sick the way we live literally promotes sickness across the board. Yeah. It's a really crazy, it's a you, really, really crazy way to look at you it. You know, that's one of the things that I think that's changed for me too as I've gotten older is I look at being healthy in a, in a through a different lens that I used to when I was younger. Uh, mm. My definition of it was, you know, like this, you know, rigid diet, my body fat percentage, yeah. you know, getting strong in the gym, lifting weights, like- The media version of healthy. Yeah. And when I look at it today, it's like, I mean, I could have periods in my life where I'm really inconsistent with the gym, but I'm still making very healthy choices mm-hmm. in my life. And and I think that represents health so much more than that. And it's also easier to uh, to make moves in the right direction when you don't put this pressure of like, oh, I have to get in the gym for an hour and oh, my schedule's so busy. It's like, man, you know, you making an effort to uh, get a better night's rest by having a sleep routine is a move in that direction. Me going outside and getting in, intentionally getting in front of the sun for 20 to 30 minutes when I don't normally do that can be massive. Me getting up after I would normally eat dinner and sit down and just plop down and watch TV and going for a walk instead. Like these are all mm-hmm. decisions that we can make throughout the day that move the needle towards a healthier version of yourself. It doesn't always have to look like this. I'm weighing, tracking my food, and I'm training hard inside the gym no. to improving your health all the time. There's always there's an opportunity in every crazy busy day for you to make a healthier choice than what you would default to. Because to your point, Sal, like so our our culture, uh, the default now is so it's unhealthy. So it's so unhealthy. So many of the things that we so much that we've we've defaulted to is for convenience and pleasure. And a lot of that is what's making us unhealthy. Mm-hmm. And so if you can just look at your life in, from that lens of, I, I'm on my health and fitness journey. And sometimes it looks like I'm super consistent in the gym. Sometimes it looks like, man, I'm going for walks. I'm getting in the sun. I'm, I'm refraining from tech all the time and staring at a screen. I'm actually being consistent. About, I mean, it, it, it can. there's always an opportunity there for you to to make a better choice for your health. It doesn't always have to be this like rigid gym routine. Now, I mean, we, we kind of brought up that study and I'm like, wow, you know, maybe the culture is shifting more towards lifting weights and, you know, this is going to be a thing. Yeah. And uh, But then there's the other part of me where it's like, you know, we're, we're up against this such a beast of a, of a mentality through pharmaceuticals where, you know, it, I just, I, I find there's, there's a split now with physicians out there that, you know, are probably even going to lean more against a lot of these, um, uh, preventative measures because now are, are persuaded more towards diagnosing and, and prescribing like uh, these pharmaceuticals to solve our, yeah, our well, I think a big, uh, I think honestly, the biggest, cause I, I know a lot of doctors personally, and I've never met a doctor personally who didn't truly want to help people. Okay. That's just my own personal experience. Like I, like I, I, at one point I trained quite a few and, but here's the problem. The, they meet with people for a very short period of time. And the biggest challenge they have is getting the person to follow their advice. They don't coach them or train them on a regular. So if you're a trainer, somebody hires you and they see you twice a week for six months, a year, two years, or a lot of like our clients who work with us for years, I can work with them through that process. Doctors don't see people like that. They see them once or twice and they're gone. Mm-hmm. So what do they tell them? Hey, you should probably uh, eat a little healthier and exercise. Okay. One in, one in one ear, out the other. Right. So it's easier to be like, here's your prescription. Take this once a day. Right. And it'll, it'll, it'll band aid, you know, the issue. So I think really has, it's really a result yeah. of the whole, the whole yeah, yeah, system. I also think that the, the human body is so complex that even something, even a PhD, uh, that's a, a general practitioner has general knowledge, a, a lot of general knowledge of the body. But I, unfortunately, at least in my experience, of all the people, they don't trained, understand exercise or diet. I know it's it's just yeah. not. It's, no. it's and even if they even like, let's say you're a doctor who has his PhD and you or you're passionate about exercise and diet, and you even have knowledge there, it's like it's still even deeper than that. Like yeah, the yeah. the amount of 
learning that has that I've had to do that I'm still doing that and I still feel like I haven't scratched the surface no. in parts of the body. And so and there's been so many times where oh I, I see a case and I'm like, oh yeah, I've seen that before. And oh yeah, that's common. Oh that that and and then it's like, but yet, wait a second. The things that I did before that would solve that solved the other person's problem, that it's not working with this person. It's like and it's like not it's there rarely ever does like this the same solution work for for this same problem again because every individual has so many different variables that affect how our body responds and how all the systems yeah, work and their behaviors and, and their, their so many mentality. specialists and doctors look at a, a single system of the body they're really good at, at, at talking about one system of the body versus how they're all interconnected and influence look, each other and and being yes. open-minded to say oh well there is a, it could be influenced by this other thing and we we don't know yet. if you're sick uh especially if it's an acute illness or injury you go to your doctor please they are very good at that yeah if you have chronic health issues uh then you want to look at your lifestyle because they're an the answer is probably there that doesn't mean that there aren't things that you can look at like nutrient deficiencies or things that you might i mean who knows you might have some underlying disease that you're unaware of that western medicine may be able to solve but uh, if it's chronic, if it's this kind of like thing that's been with you for a while and, you know, my blood lipids are off, but it's also because I'm 40 pounds of weight and I've been like that for a long time, that kind of like hire somebody who does, who works with that specifically. A good coach or a trainer is worth their weight in gold. They're yeah. the ones that will help guide you and get you there. And it's not going to be one appointment. They're not going to just give you a prescription. Here's your workout and your diet. Follow this. That's a very ineffective approach yeah. you're gonna have to work with them on a regular basis I, yeah no there's no knock on doctors i just would love to see a shift into more preventative focus like we, let's get back to not getting sick you well, know let's get back to like the the behavioral practices that we can do and we have control over ourselves uh you know in order to benefit us and, and protect us and be more resilient towards a lot of these like factors that are out there and they exist in the world Bro, the incentive I, 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 I also think that doctors should get the fuck off of TikTok and Reels because yes. you don't belong on there. And the reason why you don't belong on there is because I've never seen good advice given it in 30 seconds to a minute. Like, that's a reason, too, why I have a problem even with, with trainers just using that as a resource because what we do in, in health is so nuanced that a, a a single short answer for someone like that is it okay it might help the people where that fits perfect for them but there's also almost always an example where that that is uh that rule doesn't apply so i hate that and then what you see is you see these doctors which is super annoying that are trying to gain social media traction and they're trying to play the game that all the kids are playing Yes. You know, so they're looking at all the trends that they're doing where you find someone, you do a screen over screen and you point them out and you yeah. you shit on some other professional for what they're doing. And they're and they're playing Especially the, the ones social that are helping people and yeah. then they're just shitting on them because they're And then all and then all you all to... you do is you lose you lose a bunch of people. Yeah. And you and you're you're pitting you're helping no one. It's it's a it's a terrible place for medical professionals i even think it's not a great place for trend I mean, the reason why i love the podcast i think it should lead to something where you can explain yourself well yeah you better lead to something longer form because yeah. those things are so nuanced I, I i would never want to do this business if all we had as a tool was reels and tiktok no. to communicate how we, would we do anything would, effective? that's what i'm saying yeah, yeah. and and, and the, it's like junk food it's it's too nuanced to be able to truly help somebody in in that setting, it, so it's so it's, annoying. You know what it reminds me of? It's like uh, it's like you ever watch political debate, right? It's like two hours. Yeah, long. And they just chop the and clips. they take the oh he got him there. Oh he said that thing. That's the tagline. It's like that's not that's not. Telling I, nothing and I actually about feel like the culture yeah. is shifting some of these professionals on how they communicate because it's now turned into it's all about the uh getting those clips yeah so even the way you hear people answer sometimes is they do it with that intent of oh that's going to make this a hot going to be a sound bite right yeah, yeah. i yeah. just oh i can't i can't stand it. it's annoying when you see it and yeah. i don't know i don't think i think doctors that and noise the hell of doctors should stay off of tiktok and reels it's just there's it's too, I, look, no the ones i know ever cared about social media in that way i, I do find that very interesting yeah. Like, yeah, the good ones just stay off. Yeah, of it. That's, I mean, that's maybe that's if you I wrote know. a book, the I don't know. I know anyway. Trying to build a side business or a business through media, I guess. But I mean, the short stuff, like 
If you're a doctor and you know your shit, start a podcast or write some blogs. Yeah, you should put have some to- like you know, give yourself the opportunity to really explain what's going on. I don't know how you would communicate anything really well unless you're doing the like takedown videos. Did you so and so said this? Here's why he's wrong, and I have a PhD. And here's a picture of. By the way, in my video, I have a stethoscope and a lab coat, so you know I know <laughs> yeah. my shit. You know that clown that you're talking. I know you're alluding to right now that we talked about that not that long ago. Doctor Smug. You, did you see some That's of the? the, name, the did way, you, did Smug, you see Smug. some of the oh, influencers yeah. that were defending him? Yeah, the, defending that, and did you see the like the spin on it of like. It's a regulatory group that he's taking money from, and it no, doesn't. It's, not. I, it's I a lobby group. I know. That's, American yeah. Beverage Association's lobby group. I know. They're not a regulatory agency, and no. it's it's crazy to me to see the people that are defending that like that is okay. It, I was I was glad to see Lane came out and and say that like listen, even my stance on when I called Lane about that because I teased him and I'm like, did you take money from this? And he's like, what? <laughs> and he goes, and, and then he he didn't even know what was going on, and yeah, I told him yeah. all about it, and he goes. Wow. He goes, well, first off, my feelings are hurt. They didn't call me because I defend <laughs> artificial sweeteners all the time. He goes, but I know why they didn't call me. He goes, because you wouldn't do it. They know I say no. integrity. Yeah. That's why I'm like, dude, the, the fact that you people are defending that, uh, defending that doctor or that it's like, there's a million ways. Okay. If you're famous on TikTok, that you can get paid and make money. Okay. A lot. The last way I would do is take it from lobbying money on something like that. That's crazy to yeah. me, mm -hmm. especially something as, gray as artificial sweeteners it's not like we we really really are for sure about a lot of things on that there's still this like yeah. uh, proceed with caution we think we feel pretty confident that it's this it's that but it's like eh, probably not the most ideal thing not sure oh i'm gonna take lobbying money from this yeah. from coca-cola mm. are you kidding me that's su such bullshit know, and then to think that, that that's okay hey, that's speaking of which i just yeah. i just read a study let me pull it up here i just read a study on cancer and women uh, and this is, this is, so these were all things that were legal and approved at one point. And here's now what the study's showing. This is the title of the study. Study finds significant chemical exposures in women with cancer. So there's a clear link between PFASs. So those are called poly, uh, I don't remember the name. Look them up, Doug, for me so I can. PFAS. Yeah. Uh, and BPA exposures and prior cancer diagnosis found in large national studies. So in other words, so these are PFASs. Doug, look those up again. These are, these are I don't remember what that stands for, but there's certain types of chemicals found in plastics. <clears throat> um, and the same thing with BPA. Polyfluoroalkali substances. There you go. Okay. So exposure to these endocrine disrupting chemicals are implicated in hormone-mediated cancers of the breast, ovaries, skin, and uterus. So they're finding that, oh, uh, being exposed to these things in high amounts, you're going to have a much higher risk of these hormonal, hormonal sensitive cancers. By the way, by the way, the cancers that I just mentioned, breast, ovary, uterus, maybe not skin, but breast, ovary, and uterus, young women cancers. Wow. Mm. Those are the cancers that affect like younger women. By the way, it's such a perfect segue from the aspartame conversation we were just having too because also approved and okay like all those things yeah. are things that have been passed as oh these are fine won't kill you in all these in these studies that we show in we these can't many. possibly do studies that will show it's yeah, how hard long term like, how, yeah, yeah how it would be so hard to show long-term trends and then also connected to generational trends like for example we know that artificial sweeteners influence the microbiome we don't know if it's good or bad we just no, this is data, okay? I think it's probably not a great uh, uh, effect, but the data is right now just shows it affects the microbiome. We also know that we inherit our microbiome, much of it from our mothers. How could we possibly test generational changes from exposure to these artifacts? That's just one, that's a, that's like a hypothesis. All who's gonna pay How would you test either? that? Like who's motivated to even, you know, conduct that research? That's right. Study? It's yeah. going to be people that- The only people motivated to it are are, are trying to sugars. find ways to prove that yeah. it's okay. To cherry pick uh, which, data for them in their own bias. Which just goes back to my point of why that makes, why I was so fired up about that. And I went off, I had a lot of people message me like, damn, I haven't seen you all fired up about, because- a doctor taking money from a, a lobbying group like that, like, go take it. There's a if you're popular on social media, there's a plethora of companies that will give you money to advertise and promote stuff. Go promote a thousand other things, but to take money from a lobbying group 
that their interest is in putting out information that is going to that's in their best interest to keep pushing something yeah. like aspartame to sway the public that's opinion. That's a boy. That's a that to me that that highlights Look, your integrity. Science is objective. Scientists are not. Neither are doctors. So there are good doctors and there are bad yeah, doctors yeah, out exactly. there. Exactly. So people are like human well, point, beings point to the science. Eh, the science is objective. How you interpret it. What you choose to look at, what you choose to ignore, that's all subjective. Listen, an example is Lane Norton. We don't agree with each other. We we disagree on the aspartame conversation. Right. We've already had that conversation, and yet he's still a really good friend, yeah. and yet I know that he's not somebody, I know he would be the first person. He would integrity. not take money in that. No, and he would also be the first person if there was like a hard study that really showed issues. He would be the first person to come out and say, oh, look, look, oh, we found this. something. Data's changed and my stance has changed. That's right. And yeah. that's why, you know, why I like the guy so much is, yeah. uh, is that integrity is extremely uh, important. But yeah, yeah. it's, um, you know, with, when it comes to, you know, pharmaceutical companies and studies and funding, um, the incentives, I get they, they need to exist. So I'm not going to crap on the fact that they need, you know, we need to have profits and stuff. But see, the incentives don't, it really doesn't work to prove that something doesn't work when it's already out in the market. Who, who's going to fund that? Where are you going to make any money off that? There is no incentive to innovate necessarily in a completely different direction because it's going to cost you a billion dollars. And then you'll lose the money. Why would I bet a billion dollars in this radically different direction when I can take an opiate and tweak it a little bit and boom, I know I've got some market share, right? Yeah. So um, and that's just the nature of the beast. That's all. Just kind of inform yourself and know that. And I think you'll be okay navigating yeah. through the whole, you know, the whole thing or whatever. Yeah, no. Anyway. Oh, I know. The other day, uh, Adam, you were bringing up, um, uh, Deion Sanders and like, yeah. what he's doing over there at the buffs and everything. And just, uh, I've been following him and, and I haven't actually watched that, uh, documentary that you brought up yet. Uh, like coach it. prime, but what I didn't know, and I don't know if you knew this or not, but uh, he's actually had like foot surgery before, and he had to actually amputate two of his toes. What? So his big toe, and then his his second his toe. His big toe? Yeah. You know that that's the one that messes. I you believe up. he played a game when he was supposed to have that like done still, which is like crazy. I can't remember yeah. the full story. I know a little bit about. That. It was later on. It was like twenty twenty one, I believe. We finally got the surgery, but then. He had like blood clots, and so like uh, he had to actually go back in this, like recently, like not not too long ago, this year, uh, after he had those amputated, like also to get to remove some some blood clotting issues. Uh, but I didn't know the guy, and he just walks around and tries, you know, his best not to let it affect him. And I just have mad respect. You know, you would never even know like he's suffering through that stuff, and he he took his shoe off and his foot was just swollen you know, oh at the end wow of the day. yeah you know my I have, I have an annoying friend of mine good friend of mine who uh doesn't <laughs> for some reason anytime i like somebody he tends to take the opposing side always and i was talking about oh d on this and he's just like oh i don't like him and i'm just like it's funny how like you uh, should you know what you need to do i have a friend like that you know what you i do? do once to fuck with him what as i like say, take someone opposite no, also i would say oh you know so and so is really awesome like yeah i don't like him like yeah you know what me neither and then <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I wait to see what happened, yeah, yeah, yeah. and I did it like three or four times in a row. Yeah, and then the, he caught on, and I'm like, yeah. yeah sometimes bro. I feel like he just <laughs> takes that position, but it's like you know, I also know too he doesn't like the people that are like real outward and like super ultra confident people like that. I, it's it's always funny to me how how some people get so uh, turned off or uh, don't like people like that, like. I've never been somebody like that. Maybe because I get put in that category too. I don't know. Oh, what being just like out there? Yeah, outwardly confident like that. Like he's oh, I like see. Dion is like wildly confident yeah. and turn the hell out of that though. Give me a break. That's I mean, that's how I feel. I mean, I feel like when Larry Evans was like that, a good yeah. friend of our mutual yeah. friend of ours, just one of the cockiest son of bitches you've ever met in your yeah. life. I mean, just Big guy heart, guy worked at a gym and showed up in a, you know, a suit Three with a pink tie. Yeah. <laughs> you know so what I'm saying? With sunglasses on, doing presentations in there. And you're like, <laughs> on the outside looking in, you're like, this asshole. I can, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> But one of the the most amazing dudes, best hearts ever, and yeah. one of the most talented dudes I've ever met in my life. So I, I feel like people, they see that sometimes and they judge that right away yeah. and, and assume a lot. And when you look at all the good that Dion has done with kids and the colleges that he's, what he's done to put them on the map and help other people out. Like the dude's oh, got yeah. an incredible heart. Speaking dude. of football and feet, I would give you guys a little trivia. Did you, do you, do you guys know that one of the, the, the furthest field goals ever kicked? I don't think it's a record anymore. It was actually by a player with no, no toes. No, he had a club foot. 
Did you he's know that? Famous, famous. That. He's a famous yeah. kicker. His yeah. name is. Uh, I don't know his name. his name is. He was for the. I think he played for the Packers. It's not name. Shoeless Joe. It's another. It's uh, Tom Dempsey. There. Tom Dempsey. Who did he yeah, play yeah. for? Yeah. Uh, let's see. Was it the Packers? It oh, if I get this Packers. right, boys. <laughs> <laughs> Packers or the Bills? Uh, so Ooh, it might be the Bills. But now he said the Saints, the Eagles, the Rams, no, the Oilers, no. and the Bills. <laughs> like, like oh, two, the Bills! Like like, like eight right. teams. All on right. that very last one. <laughs> hey, for a second, you just there. moved around the whole league. You know what happened? I got two. Said. I got too confident yeah, my, there. Yeah. I should have left it with the player. <laughs> with the player with the club. Dude, you know what else? Like, so Cordy was looking at that video with me, and we were like tripping out at his foot, and like it's like, oh my god, he's got hammer toe too. Like, so you guys have seen my feet. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah. And like how like curled down they are and like smashed together. <laughs> and I'm like, I wonder if like more football players are like have like feet like mine. A lot of athletes do. Yeah. You've seen like LeBron James just and some of these ugly, basketball players smashed. that are like all oh, smashed God. in. I hate feet. Yeah. I am. I hate. I am one of those I people. You never do only fans with my feet. Oh, man. no. Even, <laughs> even nice. Even people are like, ooh, nice feet. I don't like feet. I don't care oh. what they look like. Don't yeah, like I, I'm repulsed. Cover by your feet. Yeah, Katrina yeah. doesn't like that either. If you take your 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 toes and like, but like if I if I'm like laying in bed with her and I take like my toes and I grab her feet with my toe, <laughs> oh bro, she, she hates it. Oh, she freaks out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. like, Justin and I interlock toes. It freaks me out. It's we try. We it's hard toes. for me because <laughs> I like separate them. Yeah, it's hard. <laughs> Instead of holding it under the table so the cameras oh, will catch it. Oh my god, yeah, we do it. That's disgusting. Oh, it is. Gross. <laughs> hey, did you did you guys know that? So we work with Legion. It's so supplement company for the listeners who don't know uh did you know they put together stacks on their website i didn't know oh, they actually. did yeah oh, they actually it's actually that. pretty smart I'll terrible pull, partners we are no i'll pull it up <laughs> i didn't what? know this so i'm on their website and i'm gonna i'm gonna pull up some of their they actually put together how does he put them together I'm they're sorry. they're pretty good you know mike knows this stuff right mm -hmm. so that's it you know talking about science, he's got a muscle, science based people like that's one of the things he's I got a ma muscle growth stack pre-workout energy stack fat loss stack uh re rapid recovery stack optimal performance stack and they're all discounted but it's cool it's cool because he put together the supplements that complement each other for the specific who is form. the who is the guy that mike speaking of mike and his integrity and his science-based stuff who is the guy who is really well known at, that he partnered with to put all his stuff together and he's from that examine.com examine yeah com, right which yeah. is like one of the most reputable i love that website one of the creators of it is he got yeah, it's one of the, one of the contributors yeah it's one of the yeah, it's one of the, i think it's one of the founders i think of of examine.com one of the or one of the main di guys who contributes to it i don't remember this is by the way, for people who, who want to know uh, what supplements have the best studies, go to examine.com, yeah. look up the supplement, and they will list every study and then rank the study. So it'll say for fat loss, and then you'll see all these fat loss studies. Oh, Not rank, all of them are created ranks equal. It too, huh? It'll, it'll, I didn't it'll, know that. Yeah, it'll rank them, and then you'll it's, it's really It's the best that I've found so far online. Where you could go to one source and kind of parse out like what the what the data says about you know a particular compound. Speaking of one yeah. awesome source, okay, have you got have you guys been following what Darren's doing with the newsletter? No, oh, I haven't seen. You it in guys a while. need to you guys need to get on that. Have I you been paying off. attention yeah, to I've it? Been look, open in a model. Andrew, do you, do you are you guys, is the team? I wanted the boys. I don't even know if I told the boys to to op, to actually subscribe to that and what, follow. Why, what, what's following? happened now? No, I'm just it, he if watching the evolution of it. It just mm -hmm. keeps getting better and better and better. You know, we I, a lot of it was in, in inspired by you know Sam Parr and what he did at the Hustle and the Morning Brew as far as like what they did for content. I always believed that there was an opportunity in our space to create a version of that, but that's more health centric. You know, mm -hmm. so it's starting to get like popular news that's trending and like stuff that we've said on the podcast and studies and like so it's got a lot. It's and it's done in this like snapshot, right? So those people that. Love the content that we produce, but uh, have a life. Can't possibly keep up with all the things that we put out. It's one of the better sources to get a snapshot of a lot of the material and information. So we've actually, I mean, this is its, been its own on. value, though. It's not just the, you know. Yeah, well, Darren isn't so talented. Yeah, it's like I love the way Darren writes. It's so you know that. I don't know if yeah. I told the audience this. Really you guys witty. know this because I've shared it off air with you guys. But you know, Darren's kind of a kind of a cool story. Him and I met like um, ten years ago virtually right it was before we even started mind pump uh and i was just turning my instagram on and like trying to figure the whole thing so out you started and, your grinder account yeah, and, yeah. yes so yeah. this was back in we love to hate out of days right do it, so. so 
That's I, I came across his Instagram page. Uh, he, you know, he popped up in my Explorer page one, one time and I, and I was reading his captions and I know like uh, Justin would love his stuff because he's like super sarcastic yeah. and witty, mm -hmm. has a little bit of a dark sense of humor. And he's, you could tell by the way he writes, he's super intelligent. And he's also got like, he's into health and fitness. So he's got a fitness background. So he would write some things that were related to fitness way back then. Yeah. And we began messaging and DMing. And I told him, this was years ago, this was nine, nine, 10 years ago. I told him like, man, one day we're going to work together. I had no idea of mind pump. I had no idea this or that. And we remained in contact over time. And then finally this opportunity came up of, okay, we have this newsletter that we really want to grow. We want to put some money behind it, really see if we can actually provide some good value. Who better than Darren to like write the material on it. And so you know, it's evolving. It's getting better. It's getting better. Great addition to the team. Yeah. If you guys are not uh, following this, it's definitely. What's the title? What is it called? Mornings with Mind Pump? Is that the name of it? The newsletter? Yeah, correct. It's uh, mindpumpmedia.com forward slash newsletter. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, uh, we got to talk about this on the show. This mm. is my latest favorite conspiracy theory that I'm reading <laughs> yeah. about. Oh, God. Oh, I just said, I've, I've, I said just I'm one out, yesterday. Man. I, well, I saw that one, but uh, this is the oh, one I showed you. bring that one after This is the one okay. I showed you okay. because yeah, this yeah. one has some truth in it. So I got to get the date, but I think it's October. Is it October 2nd when FEMA and, oh. uh, yeah, the, were there? Yes. You did show me this. Yeah. What, what so did, I didn't see it. What so is was it FEMA? Look this up. They're doing this national emergency, emergency broadcast. broadcasting uh, kind of test. I think right? it's October 4th for everybody's cell phones and uh, all communication, the communication. nationally is going to have this alert that's going to go out, right? And it's to test this national alert system. Okay, okay. so that's real. It's really happening. Okay. Yeah. I don't know what the date is. Maybe Doug could look it up. Honestly, October 4th. It is October 4th. Okay. So is this where all the 5G people that have been talking like, so here's the freak out? So here's the conspiracy yeah. theory, right? That the- It's going to turn on some nanoparticles? Yeah. Oh, shoot. <laughs> I was just fucking around. Are you serious? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That they're going to send yeah. out. What, that came from the vaccine? Bro. Yeah. I, is, that the conspiracy? That. is that the conspiracy? They didn't say vaccine. Oh, my oh, they God. They didn't say, yeah. Yeah. But, and they're going to be like, well, well but, they're, the, we're going to know, send know out, who took the vaccine. They're going to send out this powerful signal. I'm and there's a kill. frequency that's going to come out of everybody's device. And that frequency is designed to activate, I don't know what they called it. Yeah. Some kind of nanoparticles. Wow. And those particles then will behave in the way that they want them to, which, you know, are supposed to cause all these problems or whatever. Shut so your face. there's all these posts that are like, turn off your phones well, and I don't all know your devices all October that, 4th. But what I do know is there's been like reports of like some other country, I think it was somewhere down in South America where uh, there was some really high pitch, high frequency uh, noise that was being emitted from some tower and people were like having crazy migraines and it was like it was like uh to the point where uh people couldn't walk it was like debilitating and and to the point where some people were getting like psychotic breakdowns and everything wow. yeah so i i'm sorry but there's there's probably something like noise wise and like they've been developing weapons and things with with noise yeah. and, and like sound so that's what's alarming to me. I don't know about the whole other angle. Yeah, so it's with. it's really happening. That the whole nano thing. That's the theory. That's the conspiracy <laughs> theory. But it's really happening. So here's my theory okay. on why there's gonna why there are people on social media saying, turn off your phones. It's gonna activate these nanoparticles that are gonna do this crazy <laughs> stuff. I check this out. Okay. Let's say you're a country that competes with us. Okay. Mm. And you want to fuck with the U.S. Because that's what they do. They do this shit all the time to each other. China does it to the U.S. U.S. does it to China, Russia. We all fuck with each other. This is a nationwide national test of emergency broadcasting. And you want you don't necessarily want you want this to kind of fail. So what you do is you put out counter information to make people turn their phones off so we can't do the test properly. Hmm. So what if they're putting out like China has got these people on social media saying, don't turn on your phones, everybody, because it's going to whatever, yeah. so that this national test ends up failing. And is and this we're not even confirmed from like FEMA or any of these? Oh, yeah. Right yeah. So they said it that's on their the, website. No, that's happening. That's the real it's for website. sure happening. Yeah. Whether oh, or not yeah. it's going to kill people, that's the point. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
Okay, it just you know, because sometimes it, it comes out like it's all underground. Hey, you know, and somebody knows about something. You know how I tease you guys that I don't think there's like a group of people that are doing this yeah. master plan. I do think there's a group of people that put together these brilliant, elaborate conspiracy theories and put them out. Though I to think see that, what would happen. Yeah, yeah, I do. I do oh, that's think intelligence agencies. Yeah. I do. I do think there's a group of people that that are like smart. I I, th I saw one. Andrew was it Andrew who shared or was it you, Justin? Who shared the Aaron Rodgers? Uh, or not the, oh, uh, the um, yes, yeah, that, that's like the ultimate uh, example of like just literally looking for. Was something. it you who shared it? Or yeah, was it, it was me. It was you. It was me because they were. It was because Aaron Rodgers, like it being uh, September 11th, and then like all these like associations with numbers, like even to the point him. where his number was eight. Yeah. Right. Okay. This is ridiculous. This is Scott. Right. So his number is eight. And if you split it in half, it's 33. And so 33 then equals yeah. this. Oh, and the like, dude. Oh, dude, he connected. I oh, mean, the time on. the time left in the fourth quarter or yeah. the, with the, the yard line, the field goal. Was full kicked. moron. Oh, like, it, it was, was like over the top. We'll have the YouTube team. Yeah, there it is right there. It was over the top. Okay, but here's, okay, Funny. I got to add this one in before we're out. You know, everybody gets uncomfortable because we bring up conspiracy. <laughs> I opened the damn um, door, didn't I? Yeah. Go ahead. Go for no, it. So, Okay, what, what you actually pointed me to yesterday, yeah, I, and I was you. tripping on it all day yesterday because it's a Red Hot Chili Pepper song. Oh, that's crazy. And the lyrics are crazy. Californication. So, it, what, 25 years ago, 25. 1999 yeah. is when uh, they wrote it. And there's just all these like interesting lyrics in there that which, are like Doug, predictive. If you have that like pulled up. Uh, there's a full of like, there's probably like four or five lines. I was just like, Whoa. at least four or five lines. It's there's the like, end of the world and all of the Western civilizations, the sun may rise in the East, and at least it's settled in, a, in its final de desolation. Anyway, there's videos of them doing the lyrics and then showing what's happening today. Yeah, yeah. In the world or the US. And it's like, yeah. oh my God. Yeah, well, I, the one about I knew Justin would like little that, girl like, from Sweden. Yeah, a little girl from Sweden dreams of a silver screen. And then they put up, what's her name? Greta Thunberg. Greta Thunberg. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, and there was like something about psych psychic... Uh, Mines, psychic China, spies from China. Psychic spies from China. A lot of stuff with NASA shows us doing stuff in space. It's really being recorded underwater. Oh, right like, here. Space may be the final frontier, but it's made in a Hollywood basement. Yeah. Like, yeah, that's like wild. I dude. know. That's so well. Wild. I yeah, and it's like listen. Nobody predicted what was what would happen today, like The Simpsons. Well, that's, that's the that's thing. <laughs> I was talking to Doug about that. The Simpsons, that whole thing. It's like you know, like in terms of like there being predictive patterns of things mm -hmm. like it's almost like they're just kind of pulling ideas and, yeah. and events and then they just like make it into like, a show on, and there's like is it is it how many episodes are that or is it them just yeah, sort of yeah. falling patterns they predicted trump becoming president yeah so that. yeah they have been the best my shout out is going to go to our our partner mike with creatures of habit since he has got a product that is finally coming on board here and if you guys don't follow mike mike's a good friend of ours I, his instagram handle Doug, if you could look it up for me so we can- Chernow, can, right? Yeah, Michael Chernow. But I think his Instagram handle is, I don't know if he's changed it to the, the Creatures of Habit or Meal One. I know he's bounced back between a couple of them, but he's a good follow. He's a great story. Also was a great interview when he was on the show. And him and I have been collaborating on a you know Meal One product that is supposed to be coming. And it's been done. We figured it out, finalized all of it, and it will be releasing this upcoming month. We taste month. tested it. I remember we had the options. It's phenomenal. Yeah. This was my favorite. This is what I used to basically do. Is it gummy I, bear flavor? Yeah, this is, you will see. <laughs> you will see. So uh, shout, out, shout out to Mike. Shout out to Creatures of Habit. You guys, <laughs> make sure you guys are paying attention. Grass-fed meats, wild-caught fish, heritage pork, it's better for you. We know this. Unfortunately, it's more expensive. But there's a company called ButcherBox. ButcherBox delivers them to your door, eliminating a lot of middlemen, bringing the cost down, but the quality stays high. It's a wonderful, wonderful company. We've been using them for years. Again, they've got the best products delivered to your door if you like to eat meat or chicken or pork or any other products that you want to be very healthy. Go check them out and get yourself hooked up. Go to butcherbox.com forward slash mind pump. And if you sign up at that link, you'll get $20 off your first box and ground beef in your box for life. All right, back to the show. First question is from PoBilly21. What's the best way to build shoulders when you have difficulty with the mind muscle connection? You know, it's the same answer I'll give for any muscle group that you, you feel like you have trouble connecting to. By the way, this feels like 
you'll do exercises that traditionally are for that target body part mm -hmm. and you'll feel it more in supporting or quote unquote supporting muscle groups. So let's say we're talking about shoulders here. One of the, the most commonly done and effective shoulder building and strengthening exercises would be just a standing overhead press and all its variations. If you have difficulty connecting with the shoulders, you may feel this more in your triceps mm -hmm. or even in your traps. In fact, or even your low back. Yeah. In my, yeah. Yeah, all low back, <laughs> all, all exercises, low back exercise. If, <laughs> if you do <laughs> wrong enough. I mean, how many times have you heard enough. that though? Yeah. Right. Yeah. So I was doing a show. I'm like, I just feel it in my back. Yeah, yeah totally. <laughs> it's like, yeah, that's not good. <laughs> but you know, uh, you know, when it comes to, to shoulders, what's interesting is I often find the traps being, uh, one of the challenges mm -hmm. more than other muscle groups where they end up doing a lot of shrugging when they're trying to do certain exercises. So anyway, that being said, the answer is go light, isolate at the beginning of the workout, then move to the compound. So what does this yeah. look like for shoulders? Okay. You would do very light lateral type raises, yeah. and then we can get into the technique of All that. single joint movements. Yes. Do, do like a few sets of that. Feel the muscle with light weight, get a pump, then move on to your traditional, you know, I guess, gross motor movement type exercises like a press. And when you do the press, now that you know what that shoulder feels like, because now it's pumped, maybe a little fatigued, move in a way to where you could feel it more on the shoulders, or at the very least, think about your shoulders while you press, and that should take care of it. I, I thought you've given a different uh, piece of advice that I really like too, uh, which is uh, overhead carries. Oh, I, I really like an yeah. isometric exercise for something like this. Yes. Um, I forgot about that. You know, Lots to of your, value of isometric. Yeah, to, yeah. to your point... Um, you know, a lot of the secondary muscles are kicking in. And so you're, you're so fixated, regardless of your light or not, sometimes you get so fixated on the movement that you're, you're not, you're just not connecting to the right muscles. And so doing an isometric, uh, is a great, uh, a great idea. And I think overhead carries because it's all the way in full extension of your head like that. And you have to kind of stabilize it as you walk, uh, arguably one of the, one yeah. of the best exercises. So I would put, Overhead carries as uh, one of my like kind of first exercise yeah. priming, and then I love Z press uh, for the, mm -hmm. the having to stabilize uh, at the top. It really forces strict form, and and I would emphasize that right. So overhead carry, overhead carries to start the workout, and then I'm doing Z presses where I'm like stabilizing first before I come down, yeah. stabilizing and then coming down. I think would be a, a great option to do. I that. love isometrics mainly too if there's any kind of uh, work that needs to be done in terms of being able to pack your shoulder uh, correctly and put your put everything in an optimal position functionally. So that way, too, like when you are um, going through these movements and exercises, like you're in a better angle and alignment to be able to connect. And I think sometimes it needs a bit of work in that regard with mobility practices and just being able to understand how to articulate your shoulder blade and, and be able to depress it properly and keep yourself in good upright posture. Uh, so you give uh, your body a chance to really connect to that deltoid. Now you've, uh, you've done videos on this. I know they're in some of our programs. Do, is it on mind pump TV? Do we have videos of you teaching this on mind pump TV? Uh, that's a good question. I think so. I think we do have at least uh, a few. Um, I, I know the, um, the kneeling, um, wall circle that's for, there. That's there. So that's not that, an overhead carry. You have I, overhead no, carry. Overhead are there with yeah, Kettle you're Bells. right. He did it with Kettle yeah, Bells. Yeah. Okay, yeah, so, yeah. 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 That is there. And yeah. I, the reason why I'm saying that is because the person listening right now, I, the one thing that I would want you to do is to go watch the form and technique that you teach in that because the packing of the shoulder, the setup mm -hmm. is, is and as the it, walking is important. It's yes. he's not just holding it. The right. reason why the walk people are like, well, why should I walk? Why don't I just stand still? Walking is going to make you have to stabilize yeah, it'll create instability. at the shoulder because mm -hmm. your arm's going to want to wobble because you got this long, uh, this long lever. So you're going to hit the shoulder more doing it that way. You know what's interesting about this is as I'm thinking about this question, I can. There's one exercise that can almost always tell when somebody has poor connection to the shoulders, and it's a lateral. Mm. people who have a, this. it turns into a shrug yeah. or they rotate their hands right. and they kind of bring them out here. And it's yeah. almost like doing a clean with dumbbells, you know, to do a lateral to really feel in the shoulders, you want to lean forward just slightly and you want to lift up with the humerus, but you want no shrugging in the shoulder yeah. whatsoever. In fact, the shoulder should stay depressed the entire time. So it's your range of motion is going to be there. limited. Yeah. And it's all deltoid. It's all 100% deltoid and you got to go light. 
Next question is from Nazar Ops. Is age-related muscle loss expected due to hormones, or is it because that most people become lazy and sedentary as they age? I really don't want to become de dependent on TRT or stuff like that as I age. I mean, okay, it's so a little more complex than that. It's but, way more. Yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> let's let's put hormones aside yeah. um, because you could have hormone imbalances that might need to get treated. Uh, medically, and um, obviously this is a man because he's uh, he's asking about testosterone replacement therapy, although that does exist for women. Typically, it's men that are asking this question. So all things being equal, right? So you're a healthy male who's aging. A healthy aging male, your testosterone levels actually don't go down that much. In fact, although they still go down a little bit, and it's not a ton. I mean, I've trained men in their 70s who are incredibly fit, who's Total numbers were in the 900. Doug's an example of this. Doug's He's like, 85 yeah. and his higher testosterone than all of us, and we're on TRT. 84, come on, Adam. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But your, your testosterone will stay pretty high. You'll maintain fertility as a man. But here's the interesting thing. As you get older, as testosterone does decline, just a little bit, it's not a ton, but it does go down if you're healthy still, your androgen receptor density actually increases. So a 50-year-old man with, uh, you know, middle-of-the-road uh, free testosterone actually has more accessible testosterone than a young man with the same free testosterone uh, number because it, they have more androgen receptors. Is this what explains why when you, you take somebody, well, or even myself, when I was 20 years old, uh, you know, I d obviously definitely felt testosterone when I took steroids and I didn't need it, um, but- I can take a, my therapeutic dose and it feels so life-changing for me compared to what a massive dose did when I was in my It could 20s. be. I mean, androgen receptor density is, <clears throat> is actually more important than even testosterone levels. They, they show this in studies. But my point with this is the TRT side, let's put that aside, right? Okay, so you're healthy. Here's what really changes as you get older. Your maximum potential, okay? So let's take out maximum potential because- your maximum potential for muscle mass and strength uh, at you know 28 is very different than it is at 68. So in other words, if you're a high-level strength athlete and you push yourself and you've been doing so for years and years and years or decades, you are going to notice uh, losses in performance as you get older. I mean, I, you know, if I could deadlift 600 pounds at 35, I can't expect to do that at the age of 65. But if you're a normal, fit normal strength. You still train. You're not pushing it to like crazy levels. You're just mm -hmm. fit and strong. You can expect, and the data is clear on this, you can expect to keep a lot, if not all of your muscle well into older age. It really doesn't start to get affected until you start to get literally no joke into your seventies. Yeah. So it's the extremes where you see the big difference, <laughs> yeah. but like a normal fit, strong, I, man who's healthy. I want to add. I want to add to that because you're saying normal so much. Like normal is a fit person. It's not. No, I mean a normal. Uh, like a, if like, I got a whole and but I, what I want to highlight to this because I don't know how yeah. old this person is and um, let's just guess that they're in their 40s or so and or getting close to that maybe or more and all through their teens and 20s and early 30s they really didn't train or exercise at all i would make the oh. case that i could get you fitter healthier more muscle stronger better oh, yeah. testosterone levels oh yeah now than maybe you had in your late 20s and 30s sure so there's uh there's a there's a lot of upward potential for the average normal person because i think normal i think of somebody who are like my friends who don't really train and exercise. And even though they're not on the like obese side of the spectrum, they're still not really healthy guys. And I know that if I were to get a hold of their diet, train them, we wouldn't have to do any sort of TRT. And I would radically increase their testosterone levels and build more muscle mass and speed up their metabolism. And yet they're in their mid forties now. So there's, there's lots of potential to, uh, to not have to take, TRT, I think that's, and I've always want to make that clear on this show. You know, even though we, oh, I have openly shared about my testosterone use since day one, we are partnered with a hormone clinic. We did that because we see the need and it's a growing need in so many people, but it's never the first option. We are always going to promote somebody trying to do this the, the, the natural way first. That's always going to be the better way to do it. Yeah. And so, yes, there's lots of potential for you to not have to go that route. Yeah, think, yeah there's just a multitude of factors, uh, you know, for this feeling of aging, I think, you know, uh, after sort of that sweet spot in that window where it's like, 
you know, you go through puberty, you get all this like uh, influx of, of hormone changes and, you know, you're able to recover at like probably the highest you'll ever be able to recover in that regard. But to your uh, extreme sort of point of view, like what you're doing, I think matters a lot uh, in terms of how you're feeling later on uh, it, down the road in your experience, especially if you're trying to apply the same rules and you're trying to apply the same style and, and training methods and you know, the, the wear and tear of that versus evolving your training and, and, and moving your training in a, in a direction where it's, it's more benefiting you. So you could still apply muscle growth. Look, there's there, what's here's, this is what's interesting about, um, the aging body. And unfortunately we have bad examples because nobody is really does a good job. Most people don't do a great job. That's at, why I wanted to make the comment about normal. Yeah. So <laughs> yeah. our examples are ba basically unhealthy people getting older. And then you see like lots of terrible things. That's right. To happen. Yeah. That's a but, to totally different segment. But what's interesting is if you look at the actual, uh, aging male body and its adaptation processes, and you put in the context of fit and healthy, it's interesting. Cause when you're young, it's your body is primed to, to grow and to push the envelope. So recovery tends to be better. You're more resilient. There's no like long track record of potential injuries. Um, you tend to heal faster. Okay. Uh, but as you get older, your body starts to switch to keeping what you've done. Okay. So this is very interesting. So testosterone's higher when you're 20 than when you're say 50, but androgen receptor density goes up. Okay. Uh, you can push yourself to crazy limits when you're 20, but when you're 50, your body starts to shift so that you keep a lot of what you built. This is why people who've been like strength training forever and ever and ever, as they get older, they'll tell you it's a lot, it's easy to keep muscle. It was hard to build it when I was younger. Yeah. Now it's kind of, it's, I mean, all of us are experiencing this ourselves, but really it's the extreme. So if you look at the kind of middle and you maintain good health and fitness, you're, you're going to be phenomenal and you're, you're going to keep equipped. Yeah. yeah for the you're just not going to be hitting these crazy numbers like you did, uh, when you were, you know, when you were younger. Now I do want to add, since I did say the disclaimer first, and we are talking about TRT, it also can be very crippling for somebody who's trying to do this naturally. And they're in need of that. Like, Oh well, so yeah, that's, that's like for almost three years, you're lacking a, a if very you've been, important If hormone. you've been listening long enough, there was, there was about a two yeah. and a half, three year period when I had came off of testosterone completely and really was on a mission to to get my levels up naturally. And I like to think that I'm, I'm pretty good at this stuff when it comes to nutrition and training and, and trying to optimize my life to, to be the healthiest I can. And I really worked hard at that and using all the biohacking tools I could too. And I just, I didn't move the needle. And it was, that time was really difficult uh, mentally for me, I had, a, I had a lot of, I didn't have as most motivation to get to the gym. I would, my body wasn't responding. I wasn't recovering. Well, I wasn't building muscle. Well, my metabolism was sl super slow. And luckily I, I have the mental fortitude to work through that and to keep pursuing and, and figure, but the average person, boy, that can really send you spiraling out of control or get you really frustrated to throw your hands up and just say, fuck, I can. So yeah. it can also be very life-changing for somebody who's in that boat. So even though I originally said the disclaimer, we're always going to push someone the natural way, I also know what it's like to be on the other side of that boat of like really oh, trying yeah. naturally and mm -hmm. not being able to move the needle. And that most people can't handle that and, and will end up giving up. Oh, yeah. And I'll tell you right now, uh, you're far better off getting your hormones checked, balanced out, even if you have to take HRT, because that could be life changing for you health wise. Yeah, if you're at a deficiency, uh, it's, then it's life changing, just like yeah. a nutrient deficiency. Yes. A hormone deficiency can cause major problems. And even more so, I would yeah. say. Yeah, I, I will say most people, though, most men, they can uh, make significant improvements in the testosterone naturally. But there are cases like, you know, yeah. like yourself, Adam, even myself. Yeah, we're with at my, the floor completely. I mean, I, you know, I did things in my 30s that probably permanently affected my testosterone as I get older, but all things being equal, you can make uh, significant improvements. Um, I will one one thing I want to add to this is the the gap between you and your peers uh, becomes so oh, wide yeah. as you get older if you maintain health and fitness. Mm -hmm. It's so crazy. Like we could take 15, 20 year olds and have you know seven of them being fit, you know fit, work out, watch their diet, the other eight being your typical 20 year old. And there's definitely a difference. Okay. Don't get me wrong. There's definitely a difference. You take a group of seven year olds and you, you compare ones that exercise regularly and eat right to the average seven year old. And it's a different species. Oh, bro. You start it's to see so that. different. You really see that come 40. Yeah. 
come. Oh, for, I can see now. Yeah, forty. And, all I mean, your buddies and stuff. Yeah, is, yeah I mean, and crazy. go go to I going taking Max to school and seeing all the other dads that are that are my age. Some of them are younger, you know. And you're going like, wow, it's really, really, and that only just compounds as we get older. Yep. Next question is from some more cowbell. Can you do a segment on recovery management strategies? What factors or indicators or metrics can be used to measure recovery and what mitigations can be applied to reduce injury risk and promote consistent workout performance? Have, so, we, have we done an episode like this? We did a long yeah. time ago where we talk about like uh, recovery strategy. So this, this is so funny. This question came, well, not funny because I picked it, but this question reminds me of a study. <laughs> it's so weird. I don't know yeah, how, it's weird, so crazy. how this happened. It's so random. This just popped up. There's, uh, I just read a study uh, and this is going to, this connects to what, what, what I'm about to say about this question. I just read a study where they compared um, lifestyle to other, strategies for depression. So they said, okay, uh, changing your lifestyle to become healthier. And they used sleep, diet, and exercise. And they compared that to, you know, medication, talk therapy, all the traditional, you know, medical interventions. And the lifestyle changes in, in combination were just phenomenal, right? Just really positive impacts on depression. But here's the interesting part of the study. They separated out sleep, exercise, and diet. Which one of those do you think had the biggest impact on depression? Sleep. 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 For sure. It's massive. I know. Yeah. It's crazy. Ma sure. Just sleep. Okay. Yeah. So what, what does the this have to do balancer. with what I'm saying? There's nothing that you can do or nothing that you can focus on that will impact your recovery better than improving your sleep. I love like, that you I love that you went mm -hmm. this way because the 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 go to move in our space would be to like list off the biohacking tools supplements and, like, yeah. <laughs> or to go deep into the like programming and like make that overly complicated Tiger bomb everything but the yeah. truth is like I mean I can count on one hand how many clients of mine you know really like optimized sleep that like really had a sleep routine and 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 yet most all of them would say oh yeah I get pretty good sleep uh. and then until we start to really figure it dive in deeper and go like oh you think you get really good sleep you mean this day you go down this day and then that time at this time and sometimes it's this many it's like we just don't our culture has not put emphasis on a night routine I mean yeah. there's like a thousand books on the 15 minute morning routine and how to win at mornings and like there's so many morning stuff but nobody ever talks about the evening. And I would argue that's far more important than what you do for your first 30 minutes of your day when oh, you start off. It's how 100%. you go to bed. Oh, it, it makes such a profound uh, impact that it's the difference between you having incredible recovery and you and you not being able to figure out why the hell you can't recover from a 20-minute workout, yeah. okay? <clears throat> Sleep, nothing comes close. It's like comparing diet to fat burners for fat loss. Totally. Okay? Sleep is literally the the biggest most impactful thing you can do to give yourself like you know what, what you might feel like because you might not have done this before superhuman recovery abilities here's now here's some of the strategies and we've said them before but I'll give you the, the ones that make the biggest impact get sunlight first uh as soon as you wake up in the morning because that helps set your circadian rhythm um stay off electronics about two hours before you want to go to bed or turn the lights off and turn off the TV and don't be exposed to any light or wear blue light blocking uh, glasses, which is uh, better than nothing, but not nearly as good as, as what I just said. Go to bed at the same time every night, wake up at the same time every night, and don't eat anything about two hours before bed. Make sure you have a cool room. If you do that consistently, you'll see your recovery ability explode, literally explode, and it shits on all the recovery biohacks combined. Literally, yeah. you could combine all of them, and do them all perfectly, it's and so they won't come close. It's funny because it's immediately what I think they want to hear is like uh, yeah. the Normatec boots. Yeah, or, yeah. You know, I'm going to uh, do all these like specific mobility drills. I'm going to take these uh, supplements that are going to yep. give me all this like excess of speed up my recovery in a sense. Or, you know, you see a lot, some science that, that uh, points towards like, you know, lowering your, your core temperature and like how that's now able to then I can go back and perform and nothing nothing even compares to getting good sleep and sunlight and all the big things like that. No, I will give this person probably what they are searching for a little bit though. So, cause I do like some of the tech tools. In fact, I think the sleep eight is incredible because of the fact of cooling your core temperature like that, helping you get a better night's sleep and that it has an AI tool that adjusts to improve it and a score. Oh, it, yeah. it significantly improves sleep. So, like, I do like it tools. supercharges what, what works the best. Right. So, sleep is number one. And so then 
biohacking tools or tools that help you get or measure how well you, which I would also put aura ring in there too, because you get some sort of sleep. Now it could also have its, you know, adverse effects like it did to Doug, where Doug becomes obsessed with his score and then he's thinking about it at night and yeah. then he ends up getting worse score. But if you're not like that and you can objectively look at the numbering and then go back and go, Oh, mm -hmm. I did this, this, and this, this time. And wow, I actually, my score was like 90 something just by me shutting my TV off by six o'clock. Now I have a new habit that I do or so I love tools like that to use. And again, getting hung up on, is that 87 really a hundred percent accurate yeah. or is it 92? It's like, don't get hung up on it. Just like body fat percentage. It's a gauge to see that are the things that you're implementing. Are they making an improvement? So use tools like the sleep a, like the aura to measure how well your sleep is and then go and play with the things like what time did you eat last? What time did you stop drinking yeah. water out? Did you turn off the lights in your house earlier? Did you stop watching TV? Did you make an effort to do something like reading instead of thinking about work or business did you you know start making a list of those things that and then start to build your own really good habits around going to bed and that what and in fact you know this is how i decide like what the workout is going to look like like for a day today i will really back off intensity if i had a shit night of sleep that totally. is not when i double and triple down totally. on my lift yep. and when i ha when i feel really fresh and recharged from a, a great night's sleep, that's when I'm going to push the boundaries with my lifting. So that is actually the thing that I use to measure that more than I do soreness or volume Stress or anything management. else. Yep. Yeah. Now, now the, another part of the question was what factors or indicators or metrics can be used to measure recovery. I hate, I really don't like these tech measurements telling you you're, oh, now it's time for a hard workout. Now it's time for a easy workout because your heart rate is doing this and your cortisol is doing that and blah, blah, blah. I hate that because at the end of the day, your subjective uh, opinion or your connection to how you feel- It's always superior. Is more important because physically, you could very well be ready to work out hard. Mentally, mm -hmm. you may not be in a place to work out hard. Well, guess what? That matters. Now you may physically, they could do measurements like, Hey man, you should have a hard workout. And you're like, I, I, I'm overwhelmed. I'm stressed in my head. I don't, you know, I don't think I feel like it. Like that's what you need to listen to. So, so what factors or indicators or metrics? Here's what I like to tell people. You should feel good. You should feel energized. You should not feel like you survived your workout. You should finish your workout and feel like Holy cow, I could do that again. I feel amazing. Mm -hmm. I have so much energy. You should not feel nagging. You know, if you hurt yourself, that's different, but you shouldn't feel kind of chronic nagging joint pain. You should feel strong in your workout. And you know what that feels like. You've had workouts where you feel weak and then workouts where you feel strong. This doesn't mean you need to keep getting stronger every workout. That's obviously impossible. But you know what happens when you grab the bar and you feel like, yeah, I, I feel great. Like you should feel good. If you don't feel those things, dramatically scale down intensity, frequency, volume, all of three or one of them. And, and, and remember your workouts need to improve your life, not take away from your life. So modify it according to those things and pay attention rather than like these metrics that people are constantly looking at, which uh, again, they disconnect you, in my opinion. Next question is from Joe Aesthetics. I have a personal training business. What is the best advice you can give to someone who is trying to spread awareness for their fitness brand and build it? You know, last night I had the um, the NCI talk, you know, so you get to talk to Aren't all those. Great. I do. I love, I love those. It, it does bring me back to, um, you know, my career at 24 Hour Fitness and, and teaching trainers and stuff like that. And I get all excited and fired up. And these are very similar type of questions that I get every time. And the, the common theme that I see, and I don't know if it's a generational thing or just a, the, the bias of the trainers that I have in front of me or whatever, <coughs> but we, we don't do enough like free shit. Like I, yeah. I, this, I really did a lot of this when I first started and was growing my business because I understood a couple things. One, I understood that I, I sucked and I, I wanted the 10,000 hours, right? So I, I need to get practice. Mm -hmm. So I actually didn't even look at it like, oh, this is going to make me a lot of money or this is the best way to get 10 new clients. It's like, I need to practice. I need, need to, to get, spend time. Yeah, a lot I just, of I just time need to time. Like, yeah, so, yeah. And I could go do it by myself in a room or I could put people in a room mm -hmm. and do it on real people and practice, right? And so- so I'm chasing that 10,000 hours and may as well put people in front of me. So do I open up the opportunity for sales? What do I mean by that? Like 
if you're not networking with your community and uh, other facilities or offering your service for free for people to come in and do a nutrition uh, webinar or seminar or do a mobility class for free or you know teach teach uh, a squat lesson for 30 minutes to a group of people like man these are all and it's so easy to convince people to come get stuff for free. And I know there's a there's another side where people, oh my God, that devalues your service. And uh, no, if you're if you're a, a newer trainer and you're trying to get good, again, number one, you just want to get those ten thousand hours and get practice. So you should be doing that every time you can. And then you should be putting people in front of you while you're doing that practice. So don't be afraid to do work for free. It's okay. Mm -hmm. It's okay to do that. I mean, you just had a great, we just had a great interview with someone like Brett Contreras. Yeah. The guy he is still does it for free. a multimillionaire sure. and he, and he, and he still trains people for free because he values that so much. Like, so you got to do that stuff. And I just think that we're, we're lacking that in this, this generation of kids that are afraid to go put the work in hours. In, yeah. Right? I, I, I want to, first I want to, you know, just say like trainers are our favorite people. We were trainers. We still are uh, at heart. And we know that trainers, they're the, the lifeblood of the space. So you, as a trainer, I mean, we don't, we don't overestimate our impact uh, here at mind pump. We know that we're, yeah, we're making somewhat of an impact, but there we, we train people. I, we know that trainers are the ones that really have the, the, the capability and the potential to truly change somebody uh, for the positive. So it's a, it's an exceptional honor to be a trainer. And I, I want to say this on what you were saying, Adam. We look at things so wrong, in my opinion. If you have a business that you, where you sell a product, let's say you sell uh, energy drinks, and you want to get awareness, you have to buy product to give it away for free so people could try it. You literally have to spend money to have people try your product when you're a trainer, it costs you nothing. That's mm -hmm. not a- Just it's so, your time. It's so crazy that people look at it like, oh, it's free or what? Like you have the opportunity to put yourself out there and expose yourself to, and have people expose themselves to your services and how good you are. And you don't have to buy inventory or spend money on shipping. You could just go meet them, offer to train them, show them your value. So that's a massive um, advantage in, in that particular space. The second part is- there's this, and social media did this. Social media really ruined or distorted people's views, especially trainers, on what they need in terms of awareness to build a successful business. Right. If you're a personal trainer and you train people in person, okay, and you're crushing, like you have turned it into a full-time 35 to 45 session a week job where mm -hmm. you're doing great, that's like 20 clients. Yeah. 20 people, okay? You're Not set. Two million. You got a career there. Yeah, not two thousand, not 200, 20. 20 people. Yeah. The the uh, social media is great. It's opened up a lot of doors. I I think it's valuable for certain things, but it's it's so shocking to me. And again, I think people's uh, views are distorted. You're a trainer at a gym. First off, walk the floor. There's definitely twenty potential clients in there at any given moment. Or two, walk outside. Yeah. Those are the people that are going to hire you. You don't need to worry about like, oh, I need to get like 150,000 followers and I got to put these ads out so people know I... No, 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 no. Well, you're getting away from yes. what this actually is, the personal training, the personal part. Yes. And I think that, um, yeah, like you said, social media has definitely distorted our view of like what success is uh, in the space. And it's it's person to person. You over personalize everything, and if you lean further in that direction, where you provide such unbelievable service uh, to one person, there's there's a trickle of effect to that. Like they're gonna, you're gonna get clients as a byproduct of like putting so much emphasis and effort in that direction. Uh, they're gonna be your walking human billboard, and you know, like somebody like a Brett Contreras, like he he tapped into that, like maybe consciously, maybe subconsciously. Yeah. But at the same time, what all he was doing was leading with help and leading with that 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 passion and that care uh, to to provide that kind of experience for these people and give them results. I actually think this is one of the main reasons why we were so successful. A lot of people don't know this that listen to this show now is the obviously we uh, have grown a little bit from nine years ago, but th this audience, grew off of us going around to orange theories on uh, on weekends 
and doing these two hour long seminars that we would do for free. And we'd load it with a hundred plus people in there. And we were terrible. We were terrible at the podcasting <laughs> thing. And it, and it really, that's the attitude we had. We had this opportunity because I worked at Orange Theory, so I had a relationship with the gym. We offered our services for free. Hey, <clears throat> three really experienced trainers were willing to talk to your members for an hour about nutrition or this or that. They were like- We're oh, asking nothing in return. Yeah, we don't want anything in no. return. We're not going to solicit. We're not even trying to sell okay, to people. We literally just want the opportunity to get in front of the, that many people and help that many people. And they look at it like, a, oh my God, of, of course. Yeah, you can come in my business mm -hmm. and- service my clients like that for for free and not ask for or sell anything like a uh, no brainer. So that's what we did. And that was the original few, probably 20, 30, 100 people that listen to this show that now has millions of people that have listened to it. Like it, so this never ends, no matter how good you get, no matter how long you've been a personal trainer for, like th this philosophy still applies. And we're a volume business. Yeah. Not like personal training, which is a low volume, high service business. Look, if all of us were, if we were all put in a challenge, okay, the three of us, and they said, okay, uh, we're going to put you in this gym and uh, you need to get, you need to make yourself full-time. In other words, have enough clients to train full-time within 30 days. Okay. Do you know what all of us would not do? Start a social media page to try to get popularity, try internet marketing, try SEO. To, you know what we do? We would walk the floor and talk to people. Yeah. And within, I, I would, I think within a week, I'd be able to go full time yep. just from doing that literally. So it's right there for you. The, the, the perception that you have to spread awareness of your fitness brand. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> no, no, you don't. Now, if no. you want to sell, it'll do it on its own. Yeah. If you want to sell online programs and you need a lot of volume and I need thousands of customers, totally different. But if you just want to be a yeah, but even trainer, then, Sal, it still starts the way it you're saying. It still starts the same. Yeah, yeah. Even if you want to do yeah. that, you still got to start. The but my thing. my whole point is the whole like awareness of my brand. Like literally within a week in a gym in a busy gym, I'd have twenty clients yeah. because they're all right there, and I'm not thinking about how do I get exposure or whatever. Just talk to people. Like, everybody to thinks today in today's era. That's a, such a good point. Like they all they go they because social media on the outside looking in social media looks like the easiest fastest way that's to right you know the irony this is like the same bullshit we coach the clients right that's the yeah. irony we're coaching trainers the same way it's just like the better right way is 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 the yeah there is no what you say the other day there is no is there's no right or wrong way it's yes or no i yeah. mean it's the same thing in it's business fast or slow yeah there's no fast or slow it's yes or no it's yeah. the same thing in yeah. the business right here it's like you think that going after the the quick fix of getting a million followers by getting doing something viral to get awareness of your brand is what's going to make you successful. No, you know what's going to make you successful? You're still only going to get two quality trips. Getting, uh, getting to 10,000 hours of practice is going to make you great at your craft. Oh, yeah, getting period. great at your craft is going to change more lives. Changing more lives are going to give you walking billboards. Those walking billboards are going to continue to sing your praises for years to come because you did such a good job with them. That is what will grow your business. That is what will make more brand awareness. And then you can start to pile on the social media and the internet marketing and the email I'll, stuff. All that stuff is later. I remember I did yeah. a, um, a training once for uh, the districts. This is, these are big box gems, the districts trainers. They all came to my club and I did this whole training. And th the question that kept popping up was like, how do I get like leads? Like, how do I get people? I'm like, work the floor, talk to people. Like, well, that's really hard. People like to, don't like to be interrupted and it's really difficult. And I remember I was feeling, I was getting frustrated and I got real cocky and I said, I'll make five appointments in 15 minutes right now. Who wants to take that bet? Who thinks I can't do that? And everybody's like, go oh, do it. And I literally went up to the front desk and I said, attention members and guests, we have five free workouts available at the front desk. Come schedule them now. First come first serve. And I sat at the front desk and five people walked up and I scheduled five appointments and everybody looked at me like, Oh, I'm like, yeah, all of you guys can do that. Were just, you a magician? Just talk to people. <laughs> yeah. That's what it's all about. Yeah. Look, if you love Mind Pump, and I know you do because you're still here, go to mindpumpfree.com. We have free fitness guides that can help you with almost any health or fitness goal. You can also find all of us on social media. Instagram, Justin is at Mind Pump Justin. I'm at Mind Pump DeStefano, and Adam is at Mind Pump Adam.